So uh, I think uh, most people have filtered through now, so I'm going to start. Uh, and so, yes, welcome to, to how to make um, a meadow. Um, and I thought I would start off today with why is wildflower grassland important? Um, it might seem uh, <laughs> a little bit silly for us to ask that question. You know, we're all here for a reason. We all kind of know why wildflower grassland is important. Um, but I wanted to start off with what makes a wildflower grassland. Uh, and I think this is really important because it's more than just the sum of its parts, it's the whole thing. And I always start off with um, uh, the soil and thinking about what's needed in the soil for the wildflower meadow to grow. So we want low nutrient levels. It's, it's you know, the type of grassland is dependent on the soil type and the pH of the soil. It depends on the hydrology, the wetness of the soil, and also the seed bank and what's there already. Uh, and then moving up above the soil, you know, the wildflower grassland is made up of wildflowers and grasses, but it's also got structure there as well. And that leads on to other wildlife and pollinators. And all of this is kept going through regular management of some kind. Now that might be mowing or grazing. So what I'm talking about here is more about larger areas of wildflower grassland and how to create those. Um, I'll also be touching on how to make mini meadows as well, perhaps in a more urban environment or in a smaller garden. Um, but today is all about um, how to do it en masse, so to speak, um, and uh, where to go, you know, how to, the processes involved. Um, and the reason why, why wildflower grasslands are important is really four things. So first of all, they're living space for wildlife. And that's where a lot of us maybe approach it uh, from thinking about what's there, the pollinators, the plants that have value themselves as, as a habitat as well as in their own right, um, the mammals, um, the wildlife that depends on it. And the plants are the building blocks of that. They're also storage space for carbon. So species rich grasslands can store up to 30% more carbon than species poor grasslands. Um, and it differs depending on the, the scientific evidence, um, but that's quite a lot of carbon storage uh, for this type of habitat and just by increasing their diversity. They're also great for people. Uh, they reduce um, stress, they make people feel more happy, uh, and they're precious spaces for farming because they are part of the farming system and having wildflower grasses that are grazed by livestock produces healthier animals and also those health benefits are passed on to us in the products of animals so the meat and the dairy but all of this is important in terms of connectivity across the landscape if we want to have uh, wild, wildlife if we want wildlife to move through landscape they've got to have um, areas where they can go to to feed and for their homes and so it's about those patches and that's one of the things that we have lost. Um, so I want to show you a really short video about carbon, uh, which we had done recently um, for the conference in October. So um, it, you know, as, as we put it there, that was for COP26 and it was to highlight that actually there is um, 
a good benefit for, for carbon storage with grasslands. Um, I think that uh, Felicity, who's who's in the background and doing all the chat, um, has also put up um, a couple of links to, uh, firstly to that video, but also to another video on wellbeing and a different one on biodiversity that we've produced again for the conference to um, highlight some of the reasons why we want um, wildflower grasslands. Um, and then we come to the really sad fact that we have lost 97% of our species rich grasslands in the UK. And, um, you know, there are various reasons for that. Um, all, to, you know, starting off uh, in the last century to do with um, cultivation um, uh, during and after the wars, uh, increasing um, uh, kind of techno uh, modern technology to uh, increase the grass growth, uh, which is great for agriculture. But at the same time, uh, by using fertilizers, we increased the um, soil nutrient levels. Oh, sorry, uh, soil nutrient levels. Uh, and with herbicides, we got rid of some uh, quite a lot of the wildflowers and we replaced it with, um, I suppose, short term grass lays with quicker growing, more competitive grasses that outcompete the wildflowers and the wild grass, most of the wild grasses. We shifted from traditional haymaking to silage making, um, which meant that um, the faster grasses could be cut more. We then produced um, much more of um, the, uh, the grass for, for livestock um, to eat. But at the same time, we didn't treasure the wildflowers. We didn't allow them to set seed. And so we stopped them replacing themselves and, and new individuals from growing. Um, and uh, there's also the other side of that, which is with smaller grasslands, they were abandoned and they were under uh, grazed and they weren't necessarily cut for hay. And, you know, if there were difficult gateways to get in with larger machinery, um, that they became more difficult to manage. Uh, and so they started to develop uh, coarse grasses and scrub started to encroach and we lost the wildflowers and wild grasses that way as well. Um, and, you know, one of the final things is that we're developing uh, more of our land for buildings. And so we are still losing um, wildflower grasslands and meadows for uh, to development. So, you know, there are a range of reasons why we have um, uh, lost grasslands, but that doesn't mean that's the end of the story. We can't do anything about it. And when I talk about wildflower grasslands, I'm really talking about four different types of grasslands. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, we've got the three main types here that we, we kind of look at. So neutral grasslands, that's your traditional hay meadow uh, with lots of oxide daisies, common knapweed, um, yellow rattle, um, full of wildflowers. And then calcareous grassland, which is normally treated as pasture. Um, tends to have lower growing herbs, but not necessarily. You can also have neutral grasslands, which are on the calcare side, which are treated as hay meadows. Um, and then the other side of that is acid grassland. And uh, as it gets wetter, you get into the Ross pasture or cone grassland uh, with ragged robin um, and devil's bit scabious. Um, and you can also have dry acid grassland, which doesn't tend to have as many flowering plants, but will still have stuff like tormentil, for example. Um, but is very rich in sedges and rushes. Now, I talk about four types of grass and, and I think someone in the chat has already mentioned wax cap uh, fungi as well. And they are a particular type of um, uh, uh, organism that, you know, the fungi exist in the, in the soil and what we see is their fruiting bodies and they're often missed because wax caps come up in the autumn. And when we look at wildflower meadows, we tend to look at them in the summer. Um, so they also, wax, cap, wax caps, don't necessarily grow in areas that are uh, rich in wildflowers. So you could go to a grassland in the summer and you might not actually see that many wildflowers, but it could be full of wax caps in the autumn. And you just don't know, you have to go at the right time of year. And also, 
they don't necessarily fruit every year as well. So they can be, you can miss them. And there are wax cap grasses that have been visited for years. And we still don't know the entire range of species that are present by looking at their fungi. Of course, we can do things like uh, look at the DNA in the soil of, of the organisms in the soil and find, find out that way. Um, so four different types of grassland that we're looking at. Um, and uh, there's sometimes a fifth type of grass in that people try and include as wildflower grass and, and in a sense I suppose it is but it's slightly different so cornfield flowers are annual plants that are associated with our cereal fields they have uh, annual year-long life cycles where they need to grow uh, flower and set seed and then they will grow again the following year. Our perennial wildflower meadows that I've just talked about are those that exist all the time. And the differences are, as, as cornfield flowers, they are lovely to look at and they're very close to my heart because I spend a lot of time going out to um, cereal fields and looking at some very rare plants and some not so rare. Um, and they're very good for pollinators, but they are managed in a completely different way to perennial wildflower meadows. So I'm gonna set cornfield flowers on one side for this presentation and, and you know, think about them separately at some other point in time and talk to you really about how we create perennial hay meadows, acid grassland and calcareous grassland, uh, rather than thinking about the annual life cycle and um, you know, the poppies and the cornflowers. So all is not lost. You know, we know now why wildflower meadows are important. We know why they've declined. Um, but we aren't, you know, we can do something about it. We can manage areas of grassland uh, and restore and create wildflower grasslands so that we can create those corridors and that connectivity that I talked about earlier on. And they will sequest more carbon more quickly and store it in the soil than species poor grassland. And they will also support um, our living, uh, our wildlife, our living landscape, and they make us happier and healthier. And so that's the real reasons why we're wanting to do this and why we're wanting to increase uh, the amount of species rich grassland. So I'm gonna start off in terms of the, the bulk of this, talking about management. And the reason for this, rather than just launching into how you create a wildflower meadow, is because if you don't sort out the management, as I said, it's, they're not necessarily going to continue for that long. So it's, it's a really um, interesting, you know, good way to start. Can you implement the management that will sustain the wildflower grassland? And by what I mean for management, I'm looking at the timing and intensity of management. So we need to remove nutrients all our flowers want low nutrient levels. We need to keep the vegetation open. And that's partly to help the seed when it drops off the wildflowers because that needs to touch bare ground to grow. And that allows seed set. And all of this provides food for invertebrates and then of course for mammals and other things as well, including cows. Hay meadow and pasture management is our kind of works on an annual cycle. So I'm going to start off in the darker months of the year. You know, we're sitting in February at the moment. And at this time of the year, if it's a hay meadow, maybe grazing it with livestock. So that could be cattle and or sheep. Um, but very soon, you're going to pull those cattle and that livestock off the grassland, usually in March. And then the, the meadow, if it's a hay meadow, is shut up. And it's shut up for the summer, for um, April, May, as the flowers grow uh, and start to flower, June, July, as they flower. And then in July, late July, uh, August time, or maybe in September, you'd cut the hay. And that cutting uh, is, you know, it's cut, it's then rowed up, it's turned. And that releases the seed as the um, seed pods dry, the seed falls out, and then it's baled and taken away as a hay meadow. You let, let uh, the grass grow back a bit and then introduce livestock. And livestock are really important on hay meadows because, uh, well, they do two things. The first thing is they eat off that 
growth that's ha that started to come back. Um, they also tread the soil and remove the kind of thatch, which is grass kind of cuttings and grass that's left down there, old bits of dead leaf, they'll eat that. And their hoofs press seed onto the soil. And that seed can then germinate and grow. It needs to touch soil to, to germinate. Um, and you might then carry on grazing lightly through the winter and then you start again. Pasture management is slightly different. So again, in the darker months, you'd be grazing round about now. And then in March time, either pull the livestock off completely or reduce levels down to have very few livestock there. And you might continue slow, low, you know, grazing at a low level over the flowering period, or you might not have anything there. And then in, you know, August time, you'd reintroduce the, the livestock, so the cattle and the sheep, and they would graze throughout, taking off that growth of um, seed or of plants. And they would also knock the seeds out of anything and uh, any of the seed pods, and they would fall onto the ground and the, um, the hooves of the livestock will trample those seed in. And you'd keep that grazing going on over the winter as well, taking livestock off if um, uh, it gets wet because you don't want to completely poach the ground, which is where cattle and, and sheep make uh, pock marks in, in soil and uh, create a lot of bare ground. Um, uh, but perhaps if it's dry, uh, drier and warmer, there might be more grass growth. So you put some more on. You're doing it for a, co a condition. So. That is the annual cycle of making, you know, managing a uh, hay meadow or pasture. And that kind of routine needs to be observed. You can miss things out, um, but if you miss them out too much, like I was saying with abandonment, and um, you tend to start getting the coarse grasses come in and the wildflowers then struggle to compete with them. And a lot of meadows uh, and the diversity of meadows is declining because of that factor, because we're, you know, some of the surviving remnants of wildflower meadows are quite small uh, and it's just, it's not very easy to manage them. Um, so when you're coming uh, and thinking about meadow management, your considerations need to be, do you, do you have livestock yourself? Or do you need a grazier? And is there infrastructure there? So is it fenced? And is there water? You know, livestock need to have access to those things. If you're uh, treating it as a hay meadow, what mowing equipment do you have? And also, what are you going to do with the hay? You know, are you going to sell it? Or are you going to um, uh, keep it for, for yourself? And maybe if you keep horses, um, a species rich hay can actually be quite good for them. Um, what is your manpower available? And this is if, especially if you don't have um, access to machinery. Um, uh, and then um, what do you do if you don't have livestock? And especially on a larger scale, it can be quite difficult to recreate what the aftermath grazing is doing. Uh, but there are ways that you can do that with harrows um, to make sure that you can uh, pull out the dead thatch material and also um, allow the seed to kind of settle on bare ground. We have to remember that meadows are more than just plants. You know, I talk about plants a lot. I, I work for plant life, um, but we need to think about all the other wildlife that's in there as well. Um, and so we should always think about leaving food and shelter available and phasing management around a field. So, you know, if you've got the opportunity to leave a bank, a different bank, each year of wildflowers, that's really good for all the invertebrates that will use that, perhaps for hibernating in and living in later in the year. It leaves them with a food source after the meadow's been cut. Because if you think back, we used to take a longer time period of time to cut all of the um, uh, hay meadows. And now we can do it in a day because our technology has advanced so much but that leaves nothing for the wildlife. And you might actually want to monitor the species that are there as well. And uh, we've just run a couple of different webinars on how to monitor and different 
types of monitoring methods. I believe that they're going to be available on YouTube, on Plant Life's channel, if they're not already available. Um, I think one of them was yesterday, so we might not have put it up yet. Um, so please go and check those out. So we thought about management and we thought about why meadows are important. Now we actually want to get down to creating a meadow, which is why you're all here. Um, so I've kind of got a five step guide to how to do that. It's very simplistic. And as I said at the beginning, um, usually this is a half day workshop that we run. So squeezing into 45 minutes is, uh, is um, uh, a bit of a task. Uh, so the starting point for this is what is the potential of the site that can be created on your grassland? And are there any outstanding issues that need to be addressed? So potential of a site. The first thing that you really need to look at is soil nutrients because they need to be low. And I would advise going and taking a soil test. Um, they're quite easy to do. Uh, you walk around the, med the, the field with um, uh, a bucket and you, uh, like this guy here, if you have a soil auger, you take um, out a, a core of soil, put it in the bucket, and then at the end of it, you mix it all together. And then you want to send off uh, about a jam jar, so about 250 grams to a lab, I would suggest, especially on larger sites. On small sites, you might want to buy a test, but if you're doing this on mass, send it off. They're not expensive tests, they're, they're usually in, you know, 20 odd pounds, um, but it means that you get back uh, the information about pH, phosphate, magnesium and potassium. And the one that we're most interested in is phosphate. So phosphate binds with the soil and it stays there. And that's the thing that allows, uh, you know, competitive plants are really good at taking up and they will then outcompete the wildflowers and grasses. So high levels of phosphate are what you want to avoid. And lower levels are much better. But there's also other things that you need to look for as you wander around the site. Are there any weed problems? Things like, is there a lot of soft rush or hard rush? Uh, is there a lot of ragwort? Uh, because that could increase. Are there thistles or docks? And these are all signs of underlying issues. You wouldn't want to create a wildflower grassland uh, in a site that is dominated by problem species, partly because, um, you then need to control those species coming into the, the wildflower meadow, but also because you can make them a lot worse as well. And sometimes there are underlying issues. So if you've got lots of rushes there, is the site too wet? Is uh, you know, and drainage is an issue. Um, have a look at the current species as well. If you start to see some of the um, uh, more interesting, you know, wildflowers. Uh, and I'm not sure if Felicity's already put up, but uh, there is a, a, a leaflet on, you know, uh, it's just some common species in wildflower meadows that um, uh, an ID guide that um, uh, if they're there, then actually you might not need to create a meadow. You might just need to change your management. Um, thanks, Felicity. Um, uh, so have a look at what's there already and your starting point. You know, you should really look at that as your starting point. Um, and you want to think about what are your target species as well. And that really comes down to soil type and the wetness, the hydrology of the soil. So if it's acid um, uh, grassland, um, then it's not really potentially going to be, you know, there's not going to be lots and lots and lots of flowers, but there could be lots of grasses. And dry acid grassland is a very unique and rare habitat um, in this country. Um, and then while flower meadows, you tend to get more neutral hay meadows. Um, I mean, um, and then of course, calcareous grasslands are managed differently as well. And this also leads into that. So pH is really uh, useful to know and hydrology as well. Again, going back to the acid um, grasslands, you can have uh, wet acid grasslands, which are like cross pasture and um, uh, uh, cold grasslands are very, very nice grasslands to have uh, with all sorts of wildflowers in them, as well as rushes and sedges. Um, I keep saying that uh, wildflower grasslands need low nutrients, but there are some species that can cope with median fertility. So 
by median fertility, phosphate is measured on an index scale, uh, zero upwards. And really to create a really nice wildflower meadow, the ones that exist at the moment have a phosphate index of zero and one. But some of the plants can cope with slightly higher fertilities of um, a phosphate index of two or three. And those things like self-heal, common knapweed, oxide daisy are slightly more competitive. And it's, you know, with a wildflower meadow, actually you're keeping check on the grasses the whole time to allow the flowers to come up. I know that grasses are also flowers. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, I'm just making that distinction at the moment. And it's about that balancing act. And uh, with higher nu soil nutrient levels, the grasses are better at taking it up and growing than quite a lot of the wildflowers. So there are things that can be done if the soil is, um, does have slightly high nutrients. And one of the other things that can be done and is really important to establish is yellow rattle. So this plant is a hemiparasite on grasses. Uh, not all grasses, but quite a lot of them. Um, and it, that means that its roots take some of their, some of their nutrition from grasses. Uh, it also produces, um, uh, um, you know, energy from the sun, like all, all of these plants with green chlorophyll. Um, so it can survive without grasses as well, but it's much help. But what it does is it opens up the grass vegetation structure and allows there to be and more open structure for the wildflowers to grow. So establishing yellow rattle is a key plant. And I talked about cornfield flowers earlier being annuals. Yellow rattle is also an annual. So finding yellow rattle and making sure that it is in, present in uh, whatever seed mix you might need to bring in is a really big thing to, uh, to look for. The other plant that can um, work is uh, eyebright. And I tend to find eyebright in some of the, the Welsh um, and you know, the Devon um, grasslands, which are slightly more acidic, uh, but also tend to have a slightly wetter microclimate there as well. Not saying that I don't find yellow rattle in them too. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's that both plants can coexist. Um, and Eyebright does exactly the same thing. It's a hemiparasite, also produces its own um, uh, energy from the sun and um, it uh, reduces grasses as well. So it can act in the same way. So we need to think about preparing the site. And this is where a lot of the, um, uh, you know, the difficulties can come in. Um, because it's pretty brutal. Um, so uh, what we want to do is make sure that there are low soil nutrients. And so if you've done a soil test and you found that so, you know, the phosphate um, levels are higher than you would like, you want to think about trying to reduce those. And there's really four ways of doing it. So if it's a cereal field and you're doing a grassland creation, you want to put in a crop there without any fertilizer, something, you know, some kind of cereal, which you would then harvest at the normal time. Now, it may not come to much because you're trying to reduce the soil nutrients. So the last thing you want to do is put any fertilizer on. Uh, but if you harvest that crop, take it all off, take off all of the straw as well. Um, and actually then you've got a, a plain uh, level playing field that you can cultivate to create the bare ground, which I'll be coming on to. If it's a grass field that you want to restore to a wildflower grassland, you'd want to take as many cuts of grass as possible and remove those cuttings. Don't leave them there because that adds nutrients back into um, the soil. So these are two gentle and slow techniques. And there's two others which are faster, but they're more invasive. One is inversion plowing, which is basically a big plow, turns the topsoil, um, sorry, the subsoil on top of the topsoil. So it inverts it and you basically have a uh, nutrient poor topsoil on the surface. Um, the second is topsoil stripping, which is where you can get the machine and you take off 
that topsoil, you take it away from the site or you make it into a bank somewhere on the site. Um, both of them work, both of them are quite expensive. And if you have any buried archeology, span you need to not do these. And you have to be really careful where you do do them. And they can cause issues such as erosion um, uh, because you're creating such a bare ground, but it can work. And actually the, the picture at the bottom there was a whole field that had been uh, stripped of topsoil, uh, actually in the Netherlands for this one. Um, but they had to do quite a lot of work beforehand, uh, looking at the topsoil depth so that they didn't take too much away. Of course, you wouldn't want to do that as well, because where are you taking it? Um, inversion ploughing has been found to reverse after a period of time because the nutrients um, for some places have leached upwards into the subsoil. And so actually it's become richer over time. So they aren't foolproof. You need advice if you're going to do these. You need to get someone there that knows what they're doing. Uh, and it's usually the cost is pretty prohibitive for um, larger areas of land. So this is a these are techniques that are generally used for very targeted conservation where it's really needed to create that stepping stone for wildlife. So if you've reduced soil nutrients, let's say you have, and you've got it to where you want it to be, the next step is to prepare the site for actually putting down the seed source, which I'll be coming on to next. And that means creating bare ground because all seed needs to touch bare ground to germinate. The more bare ground, the better. And it can look pretty, pretty severe. So, you know, I see things saying 50% bare ground. I would say you want 75 to 90% bare ground. And there's different ways of doing that. You know, you could graze with livestock and then cut the meadow and that, you know, clearly pulling off the livestock uh, once there's nothing for them to eat, you don't want to starve them. Um, and then you want to uh, um, scarify the ground. And so to scarify the ground, again, you could use lots of machines. And I think there, there will be a link to machinery that you can use. Uh, so you could use uh, harrows, so chain harrows, tine harrows. You could also use a power harrow as well, which um, uh, takes off some of the surface. And you're really trying to reduce it so that when you look down at the ground, you've got 75% bare ground in the patch that you're looking at and you want that across the whole area so that that seed has um, an opportunity to touch the soil before the grass comes back. Now, if you've got, a, if you're doing an arable reversion to create a wildflower meadow, just plow. And that's fine. And actually some of the best examples now of, of restored wildflower grasslands and the ones which are most successful actually come from areas that were arable because they've been able to just cultivate. Um, we wouldn't suggest that you do that on a grass field um, because, you know, you do want uh, you do want some of the natural vegetation to perhaps come back. But you really are trying to knock that grass back so that you can have uh, give the wildflowers a chance to come back. The other thing that you could do is do a two stage um, introduction, one with yellow rattle to start off with one year and get the yellow rattle going and reducing those grasses. And then a couple of years after that, put in um, uh, wildflower seed uh, to increase the wildflowers um, present in the area. So that's also another opportunity. So that's a two stage one that you would do over a period of time. Uh, so there's various different, well, four different ways of introducing seeds that I'm going to talk about, and I've got a slide on each of them. Um, but to say that the sowing technique really depends on the size of the field that you're looking at, and that also depends on the cost. So the four techniques I'm going to talk to you about are natural regeneration, grass and regeneration, this is, uh, green hay, brush harvest seed, and commercial seed mixes. And thinking about the pros and cons of each of them, uh, I've got a little bit on cost as well, but of course that does vary depending on where you are. So natural regeneration of grasslands is actually the cheapest. It can be, uh, it can cost nothing in some cases, uh, but it is restricted. So what we mean by this is that you have the donor site, the one that is species rich, often next door to the recipient site, the one that you want to improve and enhance for wildflowers. Um, and there would be a gateway or some way between the two of them and 
you know, once the wildflowers were in bloom, you would open the gate for livestock to pass between the donor site and the recipient site, trekking seed across. Um, it worked really well. Uh, we've done it on some of the plant life reserves and those um, sites have increased in species richness in areas that were agriculturally improved in the past. The difficulty with it is, is that most of the places we want to restore aren't next to uh, a nice species rich wildflower grass. And so it really limits how we can do this because you're relying on the tra natural transfer, I suppose, of seeds on the livestock. Um, where you can do this, it's very, very useful and very effective. So we've got to think of some other way of getting species rich seed from um, the donor site to the recipient site. The next one I'm going to talk about is green hay. Um, and uh, this is where uh, you uh, go and harvest. Uh, so this is a forage harvester in this picture here. Um, a species rich, you know, your donor site, uh, you tend to chuck it into the back of a muck spreader. You can bale it and then put it through a straw strewer at the recipient site. Um, and then you get it to the recipient site as quickly as possible, preferably within an hour, because the material starts to heat up. And that means that the seed starts to lose its viability pretty quickly once it does that. You definitely want to transfer it within half a day. Um, and then, you know, if it's in the back of muck spreader, you chuck it out, like say, straw strewer, uh, you put the bales through that and it chucks it out. Generally have quite a few people with pitchforks so that if there's any clumps, uh, you separate those clumps of uh, green hay out. You want to harvest the green hay before the seed has dropped off the plants. So it tends to be slightly earlier than a hay cut. That earliness depends on the year. So 2020, if you can remember back to then, we had a blazing hot spring. And that meant that the wildflower grasslands actually all matured very, very quickly. And we were desperately trying to get out just after restrictions had been relaxed to harvest green hay so that we could do the restorations because we were having to do it very early in June compared to normal. Last year, everything was slightly later. So we had to wait for the seed to set but not be shed on the plant. And so we tended to do it, you know, uh, it go, uh, later on in June, even going into July last year, we were harvesting green hay and um, then uh, spreading it um, out. Um, I think, so in terms of costs, uh, so uh, actually just take a step back from that. Um, for every hectare of donor site or acre, it, you can spread onto three hectares or three acres of recipient sites. So it's a one to three ratio, um, which is a quite a useful mix. So, you know, you tend to make more um, wildflower meadow than you're actually taking it from. You don't need to um, uh, in, uh, put so, you know, um, uh, you can spread things out you don't need to put down quite as much seed as you're collecting because you need to give those plants space to grow. And also over time, because this is a succession thing, those plants will start to fill in the gaps as they create their own seeds. So green hay is one technique. The next one is brush harvested seed. Um, brush harvested seed, you tend to need to have a contractor or find someone who's collected brush harvested seed. So what we've got here is a brush harvester which is a machine with a wire brush at the end, which is pulled along behind a truck in this case, it could be a quad bike or a, a tractor. And the brush, um, which is uh, mechanical, um, brushes the seed off into um, a bag behind um, the brush harvester. That seed can then be sieved to get out any of the, the leaves and the um, stalks, and then laid out on tarpaulins and sheets uh, preferably sheets because actually they take away some of the moisture. It's laid out th thinly in a shed somewhere and dried. Um, the good thing about this is that you can then have some time between create, you know, uh, creating the site, um, the, the, uh, doing all the preparation work for the donor site and spreading. Green hay, because you have to transfer within that period of half a day, means you have to have everything set up and you're doing all of the logistics, all of the 
the receding in that period of time and you have to be ready to go so the the um i suppose the pressure is on the green hay uh to get it done whereas this one you can dry it and then you can use it at your leisure as long as you use, use it really before the end of November and, and sow that seed. And the reason for that is because uh, yellow rattle in particular, doesn't the seed doesn't last for very long. So to sow that seed before Christmas is, is a priority. But it does give you that extra time. Unfortunately, it costs slightly more. So you're looking at around eight, nine hundred pounds per hectare of restored grassland. But again, it's a one to three ratio. So one hectare of donor site will restore three hectares of recipient site. So you have that maximizing effect of collecting seed. Um, these three techniques are called um, natural seeding methods uh, because they're taking seed from areas uh, preferably local and we would always suggest taking local seed rather than bringing seed in from somewhere else and the reason for that is that the plants are better adapted to the local conditions and that has a knock-on effect for invertebrates so the the invertebrates are actually better adapted in that area of seed if we're trekking seed for example from southwest England to south you know to east Anglia they're going to have very different conditions there and that seed will grow but it may not flower at quite the right time and um, it might have a shorter it might be affected more by the climate so um, uh, do look at where you're getting your seed from and try and go local um, the final um, way of doing it because we have so few wildflower meadows left that it may not be possible to either do brush harvest seed or um, green hay is to actually look at buying a seed mixture and there are various places that you can go always look for a seed supplier we have um, on the meadows hub um, which we'll be directing you to anyway there are local seed suppliers that you can look at um, getting local mixes from um, and you know they're they're worth um, investigating it tends to cost much more so you're probably looking at about 1200 1500 per hectare of restored grassland um, but the benefits of um, uh, doing this uh, uh, you know buying a seed mixture is well hopefully it will, will work but also you can put that through a seed hopper and so uh, you're using conventional agricultural um, equipment again uh, you might need to bulk up the seed because um, you don't want to, all the seed to disappear within an instant. And um, so you want a lower drill rate um, uh, and uh, to make sure that uh, you spread the, the seed out. And so we often bulk it up with something like uh, uh, just some uh, sawdust and things like that so that we don't spread it all out. Um, I see I've got 15 minutes left, so <laughs> I would, I'll go through these uh, last slides quite quickly. So, um, You've done all of that uh, and you've sown your meadow. You now need to think about how to manage it and uh, immediate aftercare. So um, you want to either roll the, the meadow or chuck a lot of livestock on there uh, for a very short period of time. And that's not to eat the seed, clearly. That is to press that seed onto the soil. And it's really important that that contact is made to aid germination. You might find that if you've done something like harrowing, because it's a grassland already, that that grass then starts to grow. So you might want to, in the autumn, mow that grass so that you keep a check on it and allow the seed, seed well, hopefully seedlings that are starting to, to uh, take root, to have that space and that light. Or you could put livestock on there. They won't eat the seedlings at that, that particular stage. The following spring, you would want to again have a look and see if the grass had grown you might want to put livestock on you might want to do an early cut be careful that you don't cut off yellow rattle it can germinate uh, start to germinate in february and you don't want to cut the tops off that um, but you would only do that if the the grass was kind of uh, starting to grow and getting about you know seven eight centimeters tall and um, you felt that uh, that wasn't giving the space for the wildflowers you then shut up for hay or you reduce livestock numbers completely, even pulling livestock off and allow the seedlings to grow. 
You might not get very many flowers in the first year, but hopefully you'll get some yellow rattle. And then you would cut uh, hay in the summer and or increase livestock numbers if it's a pasture. And then you go back to the beginning again and to what I talked about in the autumn with the aftermath grazing and increasing livestock uh, numbers and you repeat and that is the meadow management routine that you start to fall into. And it's a process of ecological succession. So in year one, you would hope that you would have yellow rattle there or eyebright if you have that eyebright, but you may not have other wildflowers showing at that particular stage. You might have some oxide daisy. Oxide daisy is a early uh, successional uh, uh, short-lived um, perennial plant and it wants bare ground uh, for the seed to germinate and so you can get booms of uh, oxide daisy and people get very worried about, about that but it will settle down, give it time. Also because you've taken off the grass and you've um, created that bare ground you tend to get a boom of nitrogen fixing legumes. So things like bird, a common bird's foot trefoil, red clover, common vetch, they can also have a boom that follows the oxide daisy. Again, don't worry, let it settle down. And then from about year seven onwards, you tend to start seeing other plants starting to come through. And some of them have dormancy mechanisms like geraniums, and they will not, uh, the, that hard seed coat takes a while to degrade and for that seed to actually burst into life. So it is a, a matter of patience. Uh, so, you know, we would hope that you would have a flowery sward in five to six years, but it can take 10 to 12 years for larger herbs to establish. And for some plants, it can take a very long time indeed to actually come back. Things like Dyer's greenweed, for example. And you have to be patient. So we're going back to this example here, which was soil strips, and it didn't look very nice in the first year. You have to prepare yourselves for this. There's going to be quite a bit of open ground because you've needed to create that for um, the seedlings. But by year three, it's starting to be covered. And that's a, a field which actually has yellow rattle, which has gone over slightly there. Um, but it's starting to look quite nice. And by year four, with the hawk bits and the cat's ears uh, really starting to come through, it's looking pretty good. There are two other mechanisms that you can use to enhance uh, fields with uh, grasslands, which I'm not going to go into in too much detail now. The first is seed enhancement, which is where you want to put in some very particular species that perhaps are missing and you've collected seed. And this is where you would take divots of the soil and you would then sprinkle seed in um, to that. Um, and I've done it very successfully um, uh, with a uh, species like betony, for example, which might take longer to grow and develop, um, but also need that space. And the other way of putting those species in is to use plug plants as well. Um, and they take a little bit more work because you need to grow them on. They can be vulnerable to slug and snails. So uh, you might need a little bit more TLC. Um, and also if you plant them out uh, and then it's very dry, uh, they can desiccate as well. So mark them and you might have to go back and water them and settle them in over time. Uh, so they do take uh, a little bit more TLC, but they're worth considering for species that are missing that you would expect to find in certain areas. Um, so uh, help uh, and advice, we put up loads of links in the chat and I've seen that there's lots of questions there as well, um, but go to the Meadows Hub or uh, Hub Dol. Uh, we are trans in the process of translating into Welsh, so it will fully be there in, where, in Welsh, um, but there's also go to advisory bodies um, uh, and um, uh, like FWAG, uh, you know, please come and ask us questions as well. We have some information on the Meadows Hub as well about funding streams, uh, especially, you know, for private landowners, agri-environment may be a possibility, uh, but, uh, you know, there's not too many, but if you're a public open space, there might be other opportunities. So again, go and have a look at that as well. Um, so uh, this is part of uh, Magnificent Meadows Cymru, uh, and uh, for listening uh, to us today. Uh, we are funded by the Welsh Government for this particular project. Uh, and we will be running longer versions of this as workshops 
across Wales. Uh, some of them are already fully booked, but if you go to um, the Magnificent Meadows Cymru project, uh, you will see the bookings there. We'll put a link up to that as, as well. Uh, so go and see if there's spaces and please do come on some of the events. And it's all about you making your own restoration plan, because that's what it's about in the end, figuring out how to do the logistics and to get um, through this. Uh, and I'm going to stop there and uh, wait for Felicity to come in. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, uh, uh, again, Diochenvau, and uh, it's great that so many of you have, have joined us this evening. Yeah, that's been fantastic. Thank you. A real uh, tour through how to create a meadow. We've had a number of questions in and I've done my best to amalgamate some of them, which means I'm not going to name check everybody who's put in a question. But um, I'm going to start off with livestock. I think um, you started off talking about livestock. So we had a question. Um, can machines mimic livestock? I think you've shown us that they can. Somebody wants to know whether you would advise that some types of livestock may be better than others. And lastly, there's been a little debate about horses. Oh, you, and okay. their role. Some people saying it works with horses and some people saying they haven't. So perhaps you could talk to us about livestock first. OK, so, yes, I mean, I've kept a cat, cattle and sheep and that's trying to reduce the number of words I say. I'm sorry. But horses are there as well. Each type of livestock does something slightly different. So I'm going to start off with sheep. Sheep have narrow muzzles and they pick and they are very good at munching flowers, uh, but they can also be very good at tackling grasses, particularly the more traditional breeds. And different breeds will tackle different things, again, for horses and for cattle too. So don't label a type of animal all as one. You can't do that. So, you know, uh, uh, so um, sheep tend to pick um, uh, and they're very good at that. Cows have wide muzzles with tongues and so they rip and they wrap their tongues around um, vegetation and rip it out. Horses are actually in between. They can nibble and they can also um, tear and they can be very, very effective. In smaller meadows, they can create latrine areas and that can increase the soil nutrients in those areas so they then have to go and poop it, uh, which is a, a interesting job but and spread it out um, a little bit and they will do that in smaller areas but in larger areas they may not do that quite as much and they can be very effective i think i saw something about um uh paddocks earlier on as well so um i forget the technical term um uh perfect paddocks or something like that um and that's a way you know you can have horse tracking systems uh, as well and um uh which is where you have um kind of you fence off the inside of the field which can be species rich and left for hay actually which is quite useful and the horse is confined to the outside and then you also have areas where you have um you know, you put um, horses or ponies in and you might cycle them round. It depends how big an area you've got and whether uh, paddock paradise. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to remember the names of things. Um, so, you know, it really does depend on um, what you've got available. And yes, they can work. I would say that for all livestock, you need to be careful of the conditions of the soil. You don't want to poach it. And that goes, you know, horses are heavier animals as are cattle uh, and sheep don't like uh, really wet areas anyway, they'll get bad feet. So do bear that in mind as well. You would want to pull off um, the uh, uh, livestock if they start poaching the soil. Staying with livestock, we've talked about the use of livestock in terms of what's going in, what they're eating. There's a lot of debate on what's coming out to the other end. Um, we've talked about uh, low nutrient soils being um, good for wild species rich wildflower, uh, species, wildflower grasslands. Um, isn't manure, animal manure, adding nutrients? Of course it's adding nutrients, but we're also taking nutrients away by cutting and removing the grass. And they are taking, you know, when they eat, um, so if it's a pasture and they're eating uh, the vegetation, um, you know, they are removing nutrients and then they're adding it back in. 
So it's a balancing act. What you don't want to do is to um, put additional nutrients on there um, on top of the dunging. Um, you may want to spread, you know, I talked about horses having latrines, uh, you know, you may want to spread out some of the dung as well, um, uh, particularly if uh, dung beetles and things aren't eating um, it all at, at once. And, you know, I, I know people who take a, a chain harrow across in the spring and just spread it out a little bit more so that actually you're not getting those clumps of um, uh, kind of cow pats sitting there. Thanks. And um, it's great you've talked about chain harrows because we had a question about um, chain harrows. Chain harrows are disturbing the thatch. What mm -hmm. do you do when, do you, how do you remove the thatch? What, what should you do with the thatch? Um, so, I mean, that's a really difficult question. And especially if you don't, you know, if you don't have livestock, so livestock kind of remove it and eat it and it will disappear and it will kind of get taken in. Um, uh, you know, because the soil invertebrates and things will we'll use some of that dead material as well. Um, but you can have a lot of places with a lot of th thatch. And yeah, you then have to kind of pull it out and you kind of have to compost it on the side and put it somewhere. Um, but getting it out of that meadow is really important so that you've got that bare ground for that seed. Because otherwise you, the individual plants, once they die, if there's no replacement of plants, then you know you're going to lose those species and unfortunately while flower meadows the seed doesn't tend to last for a long time so um you know uh 20 30 years of under management and sometimes you can lose some species uh and certainly over time that's what abandonment has done okay right we're gonna talk about plants now um, I'm probably going to let this run, if it's okay with you, Kath, for a run over for five minutes, just because it is nice to answer as many of these questions as we can. So uh, bear with if uh, if you want to stay on and listen to the answers. Uh, talked about red barts here. So I've got two planty questions here. Sorry, talked about yellow rattle, different colour. Red barts here, another so, set of hemiparasite. What do you think? So it's same family. Um, Red Bartsia is a bit of an oddity. It does exactly the same thing as yellow rattle, but you tend to find it in more disturbed areas. So I often see it along trackways. Uh, I see it in arable fields and places like that. So I'm not sure that it survives so well in a closed environment like yellow rattle. Um, now, I can't say strictly whether that's true or not, but, you know, that's just the impression I get. So it's not that it wouldn't survive in grass. In fact, it does survive in some grasslands, but maybe it doesn't like very closed swards and um, where it's getting a lot of shade. Yellow rattle tends to survive better. But one of the things that I missed with yellow rattle in my uh, <laughs> effort to try and speed up was actually that it doesn't like shade. So if you have lots of grass uh, growing in an area, you really need to keep on top of it because it will shade out yellow rattle and that means that you will lose it from your grass. And, and that's actually happened. So I'm in, I'm in Somerset and I help out at a local community meadow in the middle of the, the um, town where I live. And we put in yellow rattle um, about six, seven years ago. It's now no longer there because the grass has grown it and overshaded it. Um, it's not a problem for us because actually in that time that it was there, it helped us to establish the other wildflowers that we wanted. So even though we're sad that we've lost yellow rattle, we now have oxide daisy and common knapweed and we've got things like uh, Meadows crane spill coming up. Well, talking of things coming in, Sam Hale has uh, got a question here. He is very lucky to be managing an old grassland that's been permanently grazed from at least the 1940s. In the last five years, he's noticed that creeping thistle is taking it over. Do you have any advice for him on stopping or reducing this? Oh, yes, creeping thistle. Uh, well, first of all, um, we have a whole page on management of thistles on the Meadows Hub. Um, so uh, I'll I, find I, that now and put it in the chat. Fantastic. So the first thing is, um, is there an underlying problem? Because just treating the thistles isn't going to get rid of that problem. It's having a look at, at how it's coming in. And the thing with creepy thistle, although it will spread by seed, is actually better, is rhizonymous, which means, you know, creeping. It's got roots under the surface that then come up and create plants. So 
once it gets in there, it's then sending out things and it will start to come up. Uh, so it can be grazed off by heavier livestock, so cattle. Um, uh, and, and, you know, looking at the, the areas of where it grows uh, is, um, and why it's coming in is useful. It can also be cut. And if you keep on cutting, hopefully over time, that will reduce the vigor of the plants and they will start to disappear. You can um, uh, pull, it, pull it up as well. And, you know, although we don't like spreading chemicals around, there is chemical control that you can use and spot spraying, or if you have a really bad infestation, doing something like weed wiping, which is a targeted treatment, is an option. But we try to do it, you know, if you've only got it coming in in a small amount, you might want to try the cutting first and cutting and removing. It's a slow process, but you can deal with it that way. Thanks, thanks, Kath. Pat is emailing in from Scotland, and actually we had a lovely uh, comment in the chat from somebody in Scotland that said, can't we get the Scottish government to run a project like this in Scotland? But Pat, a question from you from the central belt of Scotland. Our management regime is to scythe in September time when everything has set seed. Is this too late? No, it's not too late. And I think you need to look at the growing things. So. I probably wouldn't scythe down here in the south of England at that particular, and certainly in the southwest where, you know, we have a wetter climate um, uh, in September. We would probably want to take it earlier, but in Scotland, that might suit the conditions there. So there are optimum times to cut. Um, you don't want to cut too early. If you cut too early, then the plants won't have a chance to, to, uh, uh, to set seed. Um, uh, and you know you'll lose the the reproductive capability of those plants. Um, you also tend to favour the weeds, the ruderal species that can, can come into meadows. So and then you, you know generally we say you want to cut uh, kind of late July August time, but you can leave that into September. If you cut late though. You favour the grasses, which means that, you know, they have an opportunity to set seed. They're slightly later setting seed than the wildflowers. So that doesn't help the wildflowers in a way. So it's that optimum thing. What I would suggest is that mosaic management where you should, um, uh, you know, think about doing sometimes in some years, maybe you'd want to cut earlier or doing it in different at uh, different um, uh, different parts of the grassland, cutting at different times, uh, and then reversing that so that you're not doing everything at once. Uh, and just, yeah, have that diversity. And no year's the same because the weather either. <laughs> Thanks, Kath. Um, and I think we'll go to this question from an anonymous attendee coming last. Um, and it's taken us full circle, really. We started off talking about grasslands and climate change and soils as a carbon store. And our attendee has asked, are any of the uh, kind of meadow grassland species we're talking about or the ones we kind of want in a species rich grassland likely to disappear because of a warmer climate in the UK? I don't know whether you can help us there. Ooh. Um there's definitely going to be some winners and some losers. I mean, normally when we talk about losers are those that are going to run out of space. So they tend to be the Arctic alpine species uh, rather than the wildflower grasslands. But we might find that we need to adapt according to climate change. So I don't know at the moment because, you know, I don't, I don't know if anyone knows whether it's going to be... Um, become more wetter and um, that could change what's in our meadows particularly if they're you know water is is sitting on the meadows for longer over the winter that might affect them um, and I don't know whether it's going to become more drier and areas then become more desiccated and that would also affect plants that aren't as drought tolerant um, so I don't think we're necessarily going to lose meadows but I think we're going to see a shift and I think we have to expect that. And we're already talking about it. And one of the things that um, 
we were, you know, to think about uh, some of the changes um, associated with with climate, and um, uh, we can be talking about species and uh, actions for species in in a couple of weeks. And one of the big things that's affecting certain species is climate change, where we can see the effects almost already. And again, we've got winners and losers there. Uh, so in a rambling way, I'm saying, I'm not really sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think we have to expect change with climate change. <laughs> it's in the title. I guess the thing is, the more, the more we can if we can have more of everything and we can make yes. it resilient that's going to be a good thing yeah we then um, buffer the effects i am looking at the time um and i think we're going to um multitask here carry on typing to flora <laughs> um i think we're going to uh close down this session now it's been really really informative thank you to everybody who stayed with us um and thank you to Kat. Do join us as we continue to spring into action with plant life throughout the rest of the month. We've got um, a webinar coming up on mini meadow making. And we've got a fantastic webinar coming up on the 18th of February when we look at species conservation and plant conservation in other parts of the world and how that's connected with the language and the words we use. So I think that's going to be an absolutely cracking webinar. But Thank you very much and thank you, Kath. Yeah, thank you. Nossa Dach. <laughs>